curious uh, what your thoughts are this morning, uh, obviously with the news that uh, Embiid and and Simmons will, will not be playing. Um, I, I know you were a guy who talked about, you know, needing to do this because it was kind of part of the business, but I'm curious kind of where your mind is at right now. Um, I mean, I didn't, I, I saw the rumor, but I didn't know it was uh, confirmed. They're not playing? Yeah, no, they're, they're not playing. I mean, that's unfortunate. Um, from what I read, it was before they came. So, um, like I said, it's unfortunate. Um, you know, for me, I've, uh, I don't even have a haircut. So <laughs> it's, it's like that just to show you how crazy it is, is, you know, there's no barbers. I haven't been able to see my barber. Um, so for them to, um, you know, be in, in contact with somebody like a barber, which, you know, typically is something that we would all be doing um, before we come here. It's just super unfortunate, um, you know, but it is what it is. I'm, I'm here to, to play this game and uh, head home tonight. So, you know, we'll see. Next question is coming from Mark Spears with ESPN. Hey, Dane. I um, wanted to ask you about the uh, HBCU aspect of this and um, what do you think this also does for uh, uh, HBCU basketball programs, which uh, obviously didn't recruit you well enough? Um, I just love the fact that they, you know, HBCU, uh, HBCUs are being highlighted. You know, we, um, I think over the last year, you know, it's been a lot more conversation about uh, the top athletes attending HBCUs and considering them. And, um, you know, I think a, a, a huge reason why you don't see them being considered by the top players is because of the lack of resources and facilities aren't uh, on the same level of some of these um, power conference schools. So it's, it's not as appealing. Um, and I think, you know, this is a start, you know, with the support of the NBA uh, being included in, in things like this and, um, kind of being put on the radar of more kids because of how many kids follow the NBA is, a, is definitely a, p a positive step um, in the right direction. Thank you. Next question is coming from Mark Haynes with Clutch Points. Dang, what's up, man? What's going on? Yeah, um, I wanted to ask you your first, your opinion on, uh, or your thoughts on your first ever NBA All-Star weekend. I mean, I was a little bit nervous. Uh, a little uncomfortable. It was it was just different, you know. You it's your first time. You you, you know you sharing a room with the best players in the world. And for me, it was with a lot of players that I grew up watching. You know, that was 2014. I was in there with, you know, Kobe walked in with his shades. Um, I feel like Tim Duncan, Dirk. I mean, all these dudes on the team. I played in the All Star game with Tim Duncan and Dirk Nowitzki, right? Kobe Bryant. Um, so it was it was just different, you know, but I think my first experience, I just was taking it in. You know, I wasn't really there to um, try to put my stamp on a game or anything like that. I was just, you know, enjoying the experience and, uh, you know, looking around, like, look at, you know, look at what kind of company I'm in. Next question is coming from Jim Ozarski with Journal Sentinel. Hey, Dame, uh, Milwaukee Journal Sentinel out here in Milwaukee. Um, uh, Curious your thoughts on on closing games. Like when you think of the best closers in the league, is it all about the guys who take the shot? Or do you look at it as the gravity, like guys who maybe create so much attention, they make the right basketball play, and maybe a teammate makes the best shot? How do you kind of view closing in the NBA? Thank you. Well, I think everybody looks at closing and they say, you know, who made the big shot? And uh, for me personally, I prefer to be the one to take the shot. Um, just because you, it's in that moment is, you know, you can put your team in position to either get over the top or the team falls short. And for me, as the, the leader of my team, I think I'm, part of it is I'm most comfortable being the person that has to answer the question, you know, because I know I can move on from it if I don't make the shot or if I don't make the play. And I can handle the success if I do make the shot or the play. So uh, for me, I would prefer to, to make that final decision. But I don't think – I think when you think of a closer, you think of the person that's, that's going for the team's neck, you know, that's taking a shot. 
but that doesn't mean sometimes, you know, you're not using that to uh, to get the next guy a shot. But mm -hmm. uh, guys who guys who take pride in closing games and that want to close games, uh, they they figure out a way to to get something off and to to be the person that's doing it. In my opinion. Next question is from Mark Medina with USA Today. Hey, Damien, um, with the uh, one year anniversary approaching with the season shut down, what do you remember how you processed the play by play of that with, you know, seeing what came out with the OKC Utah game and then, you know, the NBA announcing that the season would be called off? Uh, I mean, when it happened, I, in my mind, I was like, I mean, maybe a week or two, we'll be back to playing. And then, um, you know, as time went by, I was like, you know, we really might not finish the season. But it was weird, you know. I was looking back on it, to think that at one point we didn't even know that we were going to finish the season is just crazy, you know. And then we end up going to the bubble. It ended up being a, a super solid experience, and you know, us being a part of history in the NBA, going to finishing the season in the bubble. Um, so it ended up working out, but when I think back to the time that it happened, it, to me, it just didn't register as something I was um, as serious it, as serious as, as it is for us now. You know, like like you just said, we a year removed from Sorry, that time. Sorry, I didn't quite catch that. Could you please repeat it? Smartphone, man. We a year removed from <laughs> from that time, and you know, here we are still um, up against the same thing. So I just think at that time, I didn't really. I didn't understand the seriousness of it. Next question is coming from Dan Wogie with LA Times. Hey Dan, um, you've been in Terry's system for a long time. I'm curious, how is his sort of views and your views on what constitutes a successful practice in the NBA changed over the last five or six years as teams have done it less and less? Um, and do you feel like there are any, I know obviously the rest is a huge positive, but have there been any negatives to teams and then maybe not practicing as much? I think for, for me and Terry, it's, it's changed a lot because I've always been somebody that just loved to practice. You know, I couldn't wrap my head around when I first got in the league and, you know, sometimes guys wouldn't practice. So it would be like, we get to come out here and, you know, play the game that we love for a living. Like, wow. We don't have nothing else to worry about. You know, we don't have nothing else to uh, to be concerned with except to hoop and to practice and to work out and stuff like that. But as I've gotten older, it's like I have those mornings where I wake up and I'm just like, you know, that's not what's best for my body. And I think um, that's what's been the biggest change is like you don't always need to physically go out there and just pound on your body. And, you know, that's part of why, you know, back in the day and you know, even early in my career with so many injuries, um, you know, just practicing every day, getting up and down, getting up shots, traveling, playing, you know, 82 games. It was just a lot on the body. And I think um, now the league is just getting smarter where it's like, get what you need. And I think that's where, uh, where me and Terry, like we've seen it, the most changes. Like at first it was practice, 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 um, like non-contact practice, you know, if, if it was getting a little bit rough, you know, three three games and four nights or whatever. But now it's like, get what you need, you know, whatever, listen to your body. If you just need to get a lift in and get treatment today, then that's what you do. Or we'll do 20 minutes on the court with shooting and just kind of walking through game plan stuff and then 20 minutes in the weight room and then treatment. Um, but it's more about the, the preparation and making sure that your body is right so that you can be sharp when the game comes. Um, as opposed to just feeling like you got to, um, I guess, work harder instead of work smarter. Next question is coming, coming from Soichi Hayashi with Yahoo Japan. Hi, uh, Dira, you, you're a big fan of boxing, I heard. You love boxing very much, right? So today mm -hmm. is the 50 years anniversary of Ali Fledger. Uh, so, and you support Black Lives Matter. Tonight, what will you show us? Um, dang, you said the 50, 50 year anniversary? 
Yeah, Adi Fridja Wang. Might oh, that's why they, that's why they were showing that. I saw they, that it was they were uh, replaying that everywhere yesterday. Maybe that's why. Um, dang, that was, that was a long time ago. Uh, but tonight, I mean, I'm just going to come out and um, just enjoy it. You know, I think it's another uh, – to be a part of another All-Star game is an honor. You know, I think everybody here feels that way. And um, Last year, I didn't get to play in the game, so – um, tonight, I'm just going to enjoy it. You know, I'm going to try to make the most of it. Did you learn something from Muhammad Ali or uh, Joe Fledger? Um, Muhammad Ali is, is my favorite athlete of all time, and he's not my favorite athlete of all time because of what he did in the ring. You know, I, I loved uh, what he represented outside of the ring, regardless of um, what he might have been putting on the line with his boxing career, you know, him, him being as big of a star as he was at that time. Um, you know, I'm not sure it's, it's ever been any uh, athlete in history that um, was at his peak and, you know, on top as far as fame and success in, a, in their sport and um, was willing to give it all up uh, for what he believed in. So, you know, he he to go for a reason, and it's not just for what he did in the ring. Uh, you know, and that that's something that I take away from him is um, not letting who I am as an athlete or what my career is get in the way of who I am as a person and how I you know how I how I really feel and what really matters to me. Next question is coming from Christos Saltas with Sport DNA. Hello from Chris Dame. I would like to ask you when you started your career as a pro, did you imagine that? one day that uh, everyone recognized you as one of the best guards of your era? I, I mean, honestly, I never looked that far ahead. You know, when I when I was coming out of college, I came from a small school. You know, nobody really knew who I was. So I was the my trainer and all the people around me was giving me the speech like, you know, you might be in the G League for two years. You know, you might not play. And that was the route that I was kind of expecting, you know, coming from a small school. I thought that I would come in and, you know, have kind of a, a journeyman grinded out type of career, but I just knew that I was going to earn my way. I was going, I was going to stick and I was going to find a way to, to help a team. And when I got here, it was, you know, it wasn't what I thought it was going to be. It wasn't as, I guess, as difficult to get in because I was picked high. So I started from day one and I just, you know, made sure that I held myself to a standard where, I was improving and I was getting better and I was taking it serious. And um, I think just being consistent at that has, you know, allowed me to have the kind of career that I've had. Next question is coming from Andreas Lopez with Cultura Sports. Thank you. Dame, my question is a little bit separated from basketball. My question is simply, when can we expect to see some new music out from you? Because the only thing we've gotten lately is Hulu doesn't just have live sports. So when's new music going to come out? Um, I had, yeah, I had to let the uh, commercial live a little bit. <laughs> but um, I'm going I'm to most likely put my fourth album out um, in the beginning of July. So. Next question is coming from Heather Yako. I think you're muted, Heather. Yep, I just unmuted myself. Can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Cool. Okay. A lot of players around the league um, respect the loyalty you have towards your team. And then there are those that would like to see you play in a bigger market. Um, what would it take for you, Damian Lillard, to position yourself to better your chances in winning a championship? Um, I mean, I think for every person that says, you know, I want to see him on the big stage and I want to see him go to a bigger market and all these things, like, of course, those things have have pros, but, you know, nobody ever wants to talk about the, the cons and if you you take that step and you go somewhere and it's not where it seems to be and it doesn't work out or an injury happens and you don't, you haven't established as much rapport with, with that team and they choose one guy over the next guy and now you trade it to a third team and things can fall apart. That I mean, and that may never happen, but um, it's just a lot of things that you, you can't control. So um, you got to consider both sides. Um, but for me, I think 
it would have to come down to my team saying, look, we're going in a different direction and we don't want to, we don't want to hold you hostage basically. And you know, what, what route do you want to go? Um, but just like for every person that has that to say, I'm saying, okay, if everybody doesn't think I can do it in Portland and we can't win in Portland, what does it mean? And what happens when we do, you know, like if we actually go and do it, what is that? Then what, where does that put me? You know, where does that put my legacy and where does that put my career? If my whole career, everybody's been saying, you know, he should go to this team or he should go to a bigger market and all these things. So like at the end of the day, if we just go and win it, then what, what is that? Where does that put me? You know what I'm saying? And that's how I see it. It's like, I want, I want that day to come. So um, unless the team is like, we going in a different direction, we want to start all over we want to um, let you go on to another team or whatever. I mean, that's the only way that will happen probably. Next question is coming from Brandon Harper with 680 The Fan. What's going on, Dame? Uh, you have a, a teammate in the dunk contest, Anthony Simmons. Uh, what are you expecting from him tonight? Um, and what are you expecting from, you know, what should people expect who may not necessarily be very familiar with him? They're not familiar yet, but they're going to be familiar tonight. He's... Mm -hmm. I've seen few players as explosive as he, as he is. So. Next question is coming from Terrell Thomas with These Urban Times. Dame, how you doing this afternoon, man? Um, is there Are there any players this evening that you're looking forward to playing with who you haven't had a chance to play with, maybe in open runs or anything like that? And what do you have uh, in store as far as your kicks for tonight's game? I don't know what shoes I'm gonna wear yet, so I really couldn't tell you that one. Uh, and I never, I never played with Steph. Me and Steph never played together. So actually, we did my first All Star game, but I don't, I don't remember us being in a game together. And it was both of our first All Star games. So, um, you know, I think we had different stages in our career now. So I think that should be fun. Thank you. Next question is coming from James Hill with BNC Sport. Hey, Lillard, uh, congratulations on all your success. Uh, when I was growing up in Portland with Terrell and Damon, my father introduced me to Maurice Lucas. Next thing I know, I'm a ball boy. You alluded to Blazer Mania earlier. Can you talk about uh, blessing us with a world championship and how special that would be? And again, I mean, you're putting it down and you're really uh, one of the greatest Blazers of all time. Can you speak to what that means to you personally? It means a lot. I think anytime you in your life when you invest, when you become so invested in something, you know, whether that's a person or a company or anything, like you, you care a lot because of the, the time that you put into it and how much it's been on your heart and on your mind and a part of your stress and all these things. So um, for me, it, it just means a lot to be um, considered amongst the, the best players to play in this organization because there's been so many great players here. Um, and to win a championship because we've only won one and it's been so long, uh, that, that would just be the, the best, the best ending for me. Um, just to be able to bring that back to this city because of how much I know it means to them and how passionate they are about basketball and about our team. Um, you know, if we can just get it done one time and, and bring that, that feeling back from 77 one time during my career, you know, that would, that would be everything to me. The All-Star Game this year, uh, talk a little bit about that ATL. It's closed. Uh, it's a, it's a, a great benefit to HBCUs and COVID uh, relief. Uh, and it's going to be a great game. Talk about what you envision. Uh, well, it is, it's a, it's a, um, a really positive thing, what they're doing for HBCUs and, and for COVID relief. Um, you know, I think those are, are two things that, are very deserving of the NBA's attention and, and of the help and support. So um, I would say that's the most positive thing that we're going to get out of this weekend. Obviously, the game is going to be fun. You know, you got the, the the biggest talents in the league all on one court. You're seeing guys get to mix it up and play with guys that they don't play with. Um, so that that should be fun, too. Um, but, I mean, to, to be honest, it's, 
it don't even feel like All Star Weekend. I got here yesterday, and I haven't left my room since I arrived. You know, we tested, came up to the room, and I just been in the room and haven't done anything. I, I mean, there is no barbers. Is you know, no, you can't go downstairs to a restaurant. It's nothing. So, um, you know, I'm just happy that we're doing this for um, at least for a few great causes because it, it definitely don't feel like a, you know, typical all-star weekend. Last question is coming from Charlie Lapastora with Fox. Hey, Dan, appreciate your time, man. God bless you, sir. Uh, you know, I'm just wondering, it's been a long time since 2020, it seems like, but just what is your vision and what are some of the lessons you've learned in regards to racial inequality, social injustice, to continue the conversation so it doesn't become just a trend game, doesn't become just, you know, the 2023 Black History Month thing, but an everyday thing? I learned a lot. You know, I think the most important thing is that you got to uh, take action. You got to be a part of the action because um, when, when you got such a, a broad topic and such a huge topic, it's easy to just jump in the conversation and um, everybody talking about it becomes enough because we live in a world full of gossip and news and um, hot takes and things like that. And before you, you know, you look up and a year goes by and all we've done is just, it's been the topic of conversation, you know, but nothing that could have actually happened. So I think taking action has been the biggest thing, um, which for me starts in, in my community and with the people that I'm directly connected to, you know, how can I impact and and lift them up and um, kind of plant those seeds and then branch off from there um, just to try to uh, create, um, I guess, a, a better situation for like my roots, my neighborhood, my family, my friends and things like that. And then they go on and they continue to, to do the same for other people. Um, but that's that's been my my biggest takeaway is, you know, to, to take some, some type of action. 